Okay. Hey, good evening, everybody. We are meeting with Dana Martin Davis, my very favorite art collector. She's special in a lot of ways. And, um, oh, hell, I don't know where I want to start. Dana, do you know where you want to start? Where, where I want to start? Yeah, do you have, yeah you're, you're prepared, I'm sure. Go ahead, you've got the floor. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm never really totally prepared, but I'm always spring-loaded with lots of information. Um, one thing I picked up because I was spying on everyone yep. is that Heather Lewis is in Asheville. So, so the rest of you should get in the direction of where Heather Lewis, I'm simply outside of Charlotte. So I'm in North Carolina at present, uh, contrary to what you believe. If you watch the news, not everyone in North Carolina is being held hostage. We're not all regressive political throwback people. We have an extraordinary what? Thank goodness. We have we have an extraordinary international airport, Douglas International, which services in and out of Charlotte. So I promise none of you will ever get landlocked if you decide to come and see me because I'm a little bit grounded at present. Uh, but come and see me and come and see some extraordinary things that are happening in and around Charlotte. But, um, you know, artists make up a global village. Artists do not necessarily respect boundaries and borders the way the rest of the population does. So artists without borders is what we really want to explore for the rest of the millennium. Artists are the global wanderers and caravan and the outriders in culture. So all of us need to free ourselves up from any sort of geographical boundary, socioeconomic, political boundary, and truly free ourselves up to be what we were to be as makers. And what's your agenda tonight, Paul? <laughs> I, got, I got a few now. All right, all right, all right. So where, where does your thrill come from, from your engagement with art? Well, I think, I think that context, um, context is everything, isn't it? I mean, we really do not want to start misunderstanding people by hearing them out of context and not understanding where they're coming from. So I'm a person who never truly intended to become an art collector, but someone who has found extraordinary delight and great creative freedom and a sense of exploration in art collection. So I've decided I'm not sure if it's from henceforth, but I've decided that anytime I get an opportunity to speak about art and why it's important for people to collect art and surround themselves with art is there is such a truly tangible life quality difference. I can speak to that. I know that experientially. And because I consistently collect the work of living artists, at any given day, any space I walk into, that is something that I've intentionally placed objects and art and installations, I'm surrounded by this extraordinary creative energy that's quite living, that's quite palpable, and it's been more important to me at this stage of my life than perhaps any other point. And I've decided to talk about the quality of life and how the quality of life is different because of the artist I know and because of the art that surrounds me. Isn't that the truth? Let somebody else deal with the market. Let somebody else care that this object or that object is greater or lesser. Let someone else deal with that. I'm going to speak to the absolute tangible value of the energy and the intention and the true life that surrounds us when we surround ourselves with art that's made by makers who live around us. 
in most cases, you know you, the artist who makes the work that hangs in your home. Most, most, of the t most of the time I do, it doesn't mean I know them in advance. It, it means that I meet them somewhere along the way or somewhere in the process. And then of course it's possible that I have art um, by people. It, it's very rare. It's extremely rare. Every once in a while I do have a piece of art made by a person um, I have not met before, or I haven't had an opportunity to meet yet, but it, it's a rare occurrence. A lot of what I purchase is by someone who isn't all that well known, who I believe in and I like them and I hope that my acquisition helps somewhat more than just the money. And that's 80% that's of the time. 10% of the time, it's sort of like, oh, this person's on fire and I don't want to miss it. Right. Um, no, for me, for me, that would be, uh, that would be, that would not even be 10%. That would be a really lower percentage. Oh, I know you're a better human than me. That's okay. No, no. I, I completely, I completely agree with you. And when we take, when we take the work that has the thought, the intention, and the touch of a living maker, and we denigrate that to essentially discussing the price or the value. Can I have a discount on your soul, please? <laughs> well, I mean, it, that's, when, that's when I sort of slip out of the conversation. You know, if I really wanted to, if I really wanted to immerse myself in people having business conversations, which essentially can be extremely boring, I would do that. Why take something that is one of the highest subjects, one of the most important subjects that humanity ever gets a chance to deal with? Why take that and denigrate it to a transaction? And I don't want to participate in that sort of conversation any longer. It does not mean now, hear me, because I'm also very practical. I get very excited about the anecdotal realities of artists realizing their potential, making a cohesive body of work, having that cohesive body of work just absolutely set fire, just like dry kindling in the midst of what sometimes is a very philosophically jaded wasteland that surrounds us. I sound, like I'm, I sound like I'm speaking from a script sometimes, but I'm not. I'm simply having a conversation with you all. And it's that I'm trying very hard um, because none of the artists in this seminar are people that I have met. And none of the people in this seminar are artists whose work I'm familiar with. So I am speaking to you sort of across a distance, but I want you to perceive there's not a vacuum because my perception of the art world, as different as Paul and I are as people, as different as our life experiences, the thing that is, that is really clear um, we fall into the category of the true believer and we fall into the category of being intensely curious about people that are all different places and stages and in proximity to what I say is the fire in the middle of the art village. But let me go back to context. I want, okay. to, I want, to, I want to be very clear about where I am and let you all know in a way that's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's vulnerable for me, but it's also completely authentic to let you all know that you are meeting me at not quite the one and a half year point after my diagnosis of stage two invasive breast cancer. So you are meeting me uh, post-surgery, post a lot of upheaval and different things in my life that I had to make very good and very careful decisions. You know, I think we're all caught up in the possibilities of people's thinking and what kind of crazy political decisions they might make. But unless you've actually studied oncology, 
every once in a while there comes a time in your life where making a decision is really a life or death thing. And I've had to be bombarded with a lot of decisions in the last uh, year and a half that are outside of my general area of expertise. I would also posit, this might be a really, really strange correlation, but I would posit that my particular decision making, either in the business world or in the very visceral decision making that is quite different when we come to making decisions about the art world, those things have helped me and informed me and beyond that and beyond the information and beyond the practice of discernment and making decisions about art that we choose and why we choose the art we do, I feel that I've been, I feel that I've been really spoken to and cared for and surrounded by the art of so many people I love. I mean, I don't think it's an accident. I'm speaking to you tonight, and um, today happens to be the birthday of a favorite painter, Herb Jackson, and I gave a book of Herb Jackson's Veronica's Veils painting to my cancer surgeon at a post-surgical visit because I was giving a thank you gift of something that is very important to me and is sort of a transcendent message to me and a message that's beyond our finite limitation of definition. Uh, art is all in all to me. Art is the language and the means of communication that I had before I could write. Let's take this a step further, Dana, because- I encourage you all to see it as that important. And but when it, 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 it's, it's even more, because it's an obligation of artists to give us air. They are like the breath. And without them, you and I are floundering. And- No, I, I, I hear you, I hear you, I hear your heart, but- I feel, it a, I feel it a different way. I feel it a completely different way because- Go ahead. I don't think it's the artist's responsibility to give air because the trees have that covered. Artists are sometimes the canaries in the mine of our cultural reality who are gasping for air. So- well, that's and, true too. And, and Paul's, Paul, and here's the great thing. Paul and I can start out with an argument and we end up that not only does he think I'm right, but he thinks I'm righter than he is. That's why he keeps asking me back. Yeah, He's, but I'm not there yet. Wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> see, what, what, what I want to say is to the artists who are recalcitrant, who are reluctant to put their art out, I want to say, damn it, you and I, Dana and I, are ready to see it because we're stimulated by it and you're, communi you're completing an expression and we're getting it. And that serves us. Right, but, but I don't, I don't ever have, I don't have a, ever have a sense of rush. I don't ever have a sense of push. Yeah, well, you're from the South. No. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm, a I'm a catalyst. You know, yeah, that's true, too. But I do have a sense of push. So maybe right, here's, here's the thing. It's a, it's a different thing. It's a different thing. Um, do you see... Some, some, people re, some people react negatively. Some people react negatively to, say, a sales pit, pitch, right? Yep. Some, some people react very negatively. Um, in, in my personal life, in my professional life, in, in, in business life, um, I have a track record of very interesting... I mean, you could call them cold calls, but there were very legitimate business conversations 
that on the strength of one conversation catapulted a project and that project could have been on the scale of a hospital wing or it could have been a museum, okay? What I want to say, Paul, is let's back away from the production, production, production thing that puts so much on us on the artist. Now, if someone really is, as you say, a recalcitrant genius, then, you know, ultimately, perhaps it's that person's choice to do it that way, live it that way, walk it out. I, I don't know. I mean, are there people who really cower at the idea of being discovered that keep their things hidden? I don't, I don't know that there are so much anymore. Do you, do you have some people in the group that confess to that? No, I don't think so. Though I think, and I don't know per se in the group, but I think there are artists frequently whose biggest reason for not succeeding is that they've put obstacles in their own way. Well, if, and, and, they, and that needs to be evaluated. That's not so much my subject, but we all need to evaluate, do we put obstacles in our way or do we accept a position where the obstacles are in place and do we choose to stay there longer than we should? You yeah. know, we, we need to ask ourselves that those questions about every sort of reality in life because, you know, time is short. But to go back to what you said before about artists being the oxygen, um, I think of it more that artists are very different you know, I've used different analogies in speaking before, and I'm not going to use the elephant one anymore because although you can talk about perspectives of blind men and elephant, even Ringling Brothers is not using elephants. So right. we're, we're going to back off from that, and we're going to think, what about different types of birds? And some birds have to absolutely flap like mad and fly and others are so extraordinary that they're able to soar. And there's something about the way the bird is made that that is right for them and that, and that suits them and it suits their path and it suits their trajectory. I think that what we try to do here sometimes is talk about people. That's why the very first time I did one of these things with Paul, it was interesting that the artist handing off to me was Theaster Gates because Theaster is such an extraordinary um, contemporary example of an artist who's extremely collaborative and who has absolutely no limit because he places a high trajectory. So we started that example a long time ago. But I really don't think that the artist puts the oxygen in the room. I think that we all need oxygen. I think the trees and the green plants are giving it to us if we'll not burn it up. But I think the artist is still um, the outrider in culture and the person who, even if they're not taking an extreme position of social responsibility and reflecting culture in a way that's really getting into the mix, say the way someone like Dred Scott is doing today, even if we're not doing that, I really don't think that they have a responsibility. I think they, they are who they are. They can be hummingbirds, they can be songbirds, robins, they can be hawks, they can be whatever they need to be. But whatever their flight path is, everyone around them and the world around them and culture around them has a responsibility to say, what can I do to affect that trajectory? And I take such a consistent responsibility to do that, that I'm not just buying um, art. And I, I, I don't denigrate that. I mean, it's great. I hope people buy art from now until ever and, and they're just hoarders and that's all they ever hoard. Never Walmart stuff, always original art. But far beyond that, there is a tremendous thrill 
in simply from me, you know, buying um, materials or buying a professional associational membership for an artist, exploring that aspect of uh, patronage because we need help at all sorts of different venues and different stages and steps of our lives and career. And is there anybody in the group who has a specific question? Or Paul, did you have any questions? I do I want to talk about a couple of things before we open it up for questions. Let me go to the one that's most, most curious to me. Okay. Do you feel that the role of women in the arts has changed during your involvement? I don't, it's going to be hard for me to say I don't know because I can tell you with absolute surety right this minute that one of my favorite, it doesn't matter if with all my heart and soul, I wish that somebody would lock me in the Metropolitan Museum for two weeks. You know, I'd be happy as a clam. But the, my, my favorite, even with every museum in every great place in the world, I, I don't say this because I'm grounded at home right now, and I don't say this just because I participated in the structure, but the Mint Museum in Charlotte is extraordinarily important to me. It's extraordinarily important to me for the place that it is, the structure that it is, that it is a beacon of social equality, even when the unfortunate governor who's in our governor's mansion today is not and is saying repressive, terrible things that make us ashamed when we step out and we visit our friends internationally. I don't want my Canadian friends worried that they need to swoop me up out of here, you know? And the Mint Museum stands as a beacon of that. The director of the Mint Museum in Charlotte is, is Dr. Kathleen Jameson. And I'm excited to say that, you know, I've got a lot of favorite venue directors curators, all sorts of people who are in different aspects of art, even the educational facilities. We, we don't really think about what place the, uh, the curators and some of the educators who are on staff at these museums play in the way we're exposed to a greater art vision. But they're wonderful professionals. And women who are doing these positions uh, along with, say, the woman who owns the restaurant that adjoins the Met Museum, the women who are in partnership and do the food together and those sorts of things. Yeah, that really thrills me that, sure, it's really great that there's a Judah Schechter right there. Or you start thinking of different women's names that so many of us have pitched in and advocated for right now in front of the Met Museum. There is a giant, I don't know if it's, I don't know how big the banner is, but there is a massive, huge woman. Um, the because the follows there before. There, is that what well, I mean, there's a, there's a photography exhibit there, and the woman, who's, the woman who's pictured in this photograph that's on this huge, oh. you know, is, is Dana Hoey, who's an amazing photographer in her own right. And, you know, this kind of thing encourages me. It encourages me. And I can say, well, sure, I think that women are making tremendous inroads. I think that it's our time now. I think it's our time. I think it's our time now. I think it's our time going forward. I think it's our time to stop making excuses. I think it's time for people like me who have really battled it. You know, it's, it, it's wonderful and uh, fulfilling and encouraging to talk about art, but for me to very openly talk about the sort of absolute battle that needs to be done say in commercial construction and some of the not so fun conversations that I've had making some wonderful tangible things happen, you know, I have to keep focused. So, so 
every artist, every artist has to keep focused. What are you, what are you going for? What's your trajectory? And don't long for, don't long for the trajectory of someone else who's not you, who is not on your path. I could not really truly have figured out exactly how to do all the different pieces that put me where I am right now. And I'm in a position of, you know, I just have to say all things considered, because <laughs> there's, there's something about a cancer diagnosis that completely clarifies your thinking about anything you were getting muddled about. And um, all things considered, I have to say that to take the thing you do vocationally and to take the thing that you're most passionate about and see these things come together. And then along the way, like-minded people, you know, simply become at different times encouragement for each other. And we come along and, and we um, are at times elements of collaboration. Other times we're catalysts in each other's projects. But we're all completely woven together. We haven't all figured out how we are yet, but we simply have to enjoy it and revel in it and love where we are and love where we are today. And loving where we are today, I think gets us to the next step of where we are tomorrow that's different or better than we could have imagined. Who's got a question? Oh, you guys raise some hands and ask some questions and I'm gonna ask Dana one more question. Somebody waving hands? Richard, I saw you scratch that ear. I think you just bought the Van Gogh. Um, if you guys have questions, raise your hands. Dana, has your, I think two things is my sense, but I want to know if it's true. Has, has, okay, but here's, what, what, no, okay, nobody, no, no question, no feedback. No, no. I see Giacomo has one. Let's go. We'll do that. We'll go there. Giacomo, go ahead. Um, hi. Uh, about, um, I don't know if I'm the right path, but by the way, I have experience with one art, one, one commissioner, and I always I said, oh, um, we get a discussion, and then I said, I'm not a doctor, I'm an artist. I don't have a responsibility to save people, and... I want to say something. And he was working like he was MTA uh, commissioner. And he working that day with one uh, exit of our MTA to make better with an architect. And this year was really, really bad, really, really uh, dangerous. But day by day, he said, you know, I work in there. We make a beautiful exit and the neighbor, everything changed. So, I don't know, I think artists can change, can have a possibility, but it's not the same responsibility like a doctor. Anna, do you want to comment on that? Do I? Yeah. Well, I've got, you know, I, I have a, Having, having, having spoken about this as a general thing so many different times, um, I would say, I would say, I mean, we decide what, being, being a doctor is important. But, like, uh... being, being, but, you know, being an artist, being an artist is important too somehow in what you said, somehow in what you said, and, and, and believe me, I certainly don't denigrate anything that's, that's a medical skill. <laughs> no, 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 of course. I certainly, I, I certainly don't. But I also say that we have to, we have to say, just as, wouldn't, wouldn't you say that if you had a really serious medical problem, you would go to a different degree or a different specialty of doctor? I think that we have to be, I think that we have to be very clear that we clearly have hierarchies of practice. So 
as, as an art, if, if you do not have a hierarchy of practice as an artist, you either don't know very much yet, or you're sort of a megalomaniac. You might be the Donald Trump of artists if you don't. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, we, we have to have a sense of where we are. Um, and so, you know, in ter but, in ter but in terms of being an artist, what is your, what is your responsibility? You know, that's, that's, that's completely your thing to work out. That's not my thing to define. Um, I would say, I would say this, we have to respect the consistent. This is what I would say when it comes to making the analogies that we must respect the consistent practice of art. Correct? Because we say that lawyers practice, doctors practice, okay. artists, artists, artists practice. I know a specific artist right now, I'm not going to say her name, but she would know immediately who I'm talking about, but she had to move from a very large studio to a very small space. And um, before I had seen in her space in um, Manhattan, I had seen you know, very large paintings in very large studio space. And a lot of what she's working on right now are very small canvases. And she's doing small eight by eight canvases. And in a lot of cases, she's doing things that are around her. It might be the cantaloupe that she slices and she does a painting of that. She's still this extraordinary painter. She's still the same extraordinary painter. She has changed her practice at present to meet her different circumstances. And I have a lot of respect for that. So, you know, an artist has, an, has a responsibility to continue on in practice. As a collector, the only time I get upset is when somebody says, oh, the hell with this. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to go do something else. And I think, but I believed in you. Yeah. And I, I live with your work and your work is really good. And let's have a conversation. And I'm thinking of someone right now. I'm not going to say it, but let's have a conversation because that stuff that you were doing about five or six years ago, I looked at that and I thought, wow, this painter really cracked the code. I saw this work in a museum exhibit and I just went, have to have it, that's it, that's it. The next time I saw that person's work was with a very prominent um, dealer. It was set up on a display in Miami during Art Basel there in the convention center. I walked in. I saw that artist work from across the room, went, cracked the code, did it, did it, really broke through. And I cannot tell you everything that happened, but in subsequent years, um, the, what I thought, what I truly thought was the breakthrough work and definitive genius, that person did not continue to walk that out. Okay, yeah. is that my responsibility? Is that the artist's responsibility? Is it the dealer's responsibility? You know, I would suggest to you that I'm the most hands-off sort of person. I believe, I believe in the um, autonomy of an artist within reason. Everybody needs to take really good advice about things they do, right? but I believe in the autonomy of an artist to make, to make their thing so much that it doesn't matter how many artists I know. I personally, I've never commissioned work. And I think I've said this to Paul before, and Paul may know this about me, but the truth is even artists I love and follow their work, I walk into an exhibit and I see their work on display and if everything completely filled, it's exactly going to be that one. It's that one. And that's number one and that's number two. And, you know, 
when you come to the external world, looking at your work and judging you that way, that's really hard. Yeah. You know? It sure is. Yes, it is. It, 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 it's really, really hard. It's extremely vulnerable because most of the time in relative, unless you work more in a collaborative or factory setting, most of the time in relative personal commune with this, with this work and this object, you pour yourself into it. Then someone has the absolute audacity <laughs> Yeah. To, walk, to walk in and from across the room say, boom, that over there, or this instead of this. You know, but for so many of us, it's not any of us, not any of us having the ability to say, oh, yes, this is good, this is bad, this is, it, it's not that. It's not that we're even 100% right. It's just that through making a consistent number of decisions that yield a consistent number of great results, we each have different degrees of confidence in our own decision-making ability in that subject, you know? Yeah. But if I really get to know you and we talk and I understand your process, every once in a while, it doesn't always happen with the artist, and that's never what I personally am looking for. I cannot explain to you what other um, collectors are, are looking for. I mean, frankly, some collectors are, um, they're hoarders. They're hoarders. They simply hoard very good stuff. They, they hoard very expensive stuff. It's fascinating to meet collectors and they know when this particular commodity goes on sale, this is the person bidding against it, and this is the other person who's get bidding against me because we are the two people that essentially have this market on lock because this is what we collect. You know, I don't understand it like that. I don't understand it. I understand it as the, um, as the cultural landmark of a transaction between living people. I understand it as a transaction that as a person who encodes work, you want people to decode your work. You want people to understand it, to wrestle with it, to care about it, to respect it, or if you really respect that person's opinion, you want that person to be able to tell you, you know what, when you did that thing back there, I really thought you cracked the code. I really thought you did it. I really thought you had broken into what it means to be a successful contemporary artist. Now tell me why you've gone off wandering on this other path, doing this other thing now. You know, I could ask that kind of question, but that's extremely personal and that's just for one person. The, the kind of conversations we try to have here, what ideas have we all wrestled with in our quiet, in the middle of the most wonderful museum, in front of the piece that moves you the most, or in your shower? What question comes up and you hit on a kernel of truth that has a universal possibility of being useful to more makers. That's what we're trying to do here. So as we sort of virtually pass around a peace pipe, we sit here at the fire and we're, we're sitting around the fire of a virtual village of makers. And as we pass this pipe from person to person, we get to say, this seemed true to me. This is what's true to me. This is how, and the more, um, the more honest we are, how can you be more honest? How can you be more authentic than artists who put their hearts and their souls and their minds and their intention and their best imagination into work 
to put out before the world like casting pearls before swine. It's a hard thing. And it's, it's a beautiful, tender, wonderful group of people who are doing this. How do we best nurture each other? What do we need? Can we be honest about what we need on any given day and say, yes, I know how so-and-so solved that, or I know what worked for this other person. Who else has a question? I'm tired of hearing my own voice. <laughs> Frederica has a question, and I have a question. Let's go to Frederica. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for being so open with us and what you're going through. And I'm curious. I've got the kind of collector you're not, which I think is wonderful, because I've always been curious, and I have to have one of those, and then one of those, and then yeah. one of those to finish off a set, right? And obviously, that's not what you're doing. No. What it sounds like you're collecting very much from your heart, and you have yet some intellectual framework for what you're doing. And I'm curious if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Well, um, I had the opportunity. I'm I'm not at press. I'm not at present putting together a corporate collection. But I had, the, I had the tremendous advantage of putting together a personal collection and then at the same time putting together a corporate collection. And by doing that, it was interesting to um, check myself and evaluate myself and how did I make these decisions and how did I make these um, how did I make these distinctions and why did something make this cut and why did something make that cut and why did something I absolutely love not end up either place? Why um, have there been painters? Why have there been painters whose work I loved and followed for 10 years and it wasn't until maybe that 10th year that I went on a studio visit and went, that's it. That is it. That's exactly it. That's mine. I know it's mine. Um, I've also had the advantage um, of having three children, all of whom are now adults, young adults, but they're, they're adults. And there's no more honest, feet on the ground, clarity, than going through this whole collecting life, going to art fairs. Each of my children by turns has been different because I think art conversations are so individual. You know? Um, I would take one child with me to Chicago when I did this. One child would be in New York. One child would be in this gallery. We might go as a group, but I would initiate an individual conversation with that child. Only once or twice has someone, and I can think of the specific pieces and reasons, and they're not important, they're not instructional, they're too personal, but only twice have my family members actually exercised veto power, like strong emotional negative reaction to something, don't want to be around it only twice, um, we began giving to museums and collecting institutions over 10 years ago. So the extraordinary thing for me is that the piece that's in front of the Mint Museum right now on that giant banner is a photograph that I bought for the museum. The deal, the dealer brought it, brought it, and brought it in. And I briefly looked at it in my house, but it never even came to my house. There's certain things that have been packed up and shipped directly to museums. In one particular case, it was because I knew if I took it out, and it was a very sculptural stainless steel chair by Vivian Beer, if I took it out, I would have wanted it. I would have wanted to keep it, and I needed to send it on. Vivian, by the way, talk about women in art. Vivian uh, Beer 
is a metal worker, furniture designer, sculptor, however you want to label her, but she won Ellen's design challenge. So to um, have bought the work of somebody years and years ago, and then to have given her work into a permanent museum collection in Memphis. And then just this year see that, oh, by the way, she won Ellen's design challenge out of all these furniture designers. I kept watching. It's like, uh, yeah, I do sort of have this thing. I have this, I have this wonderful, intangible, magical thing. Um, but to collect the work of an emerging artist simply means that you care more about supporting that person and their work and you care more about them making more of that work than you care about what that work is ever going to do for you. I think it's a completely, um, for me, I don't mean to go, go completely spicoli on everybody, but it is bogus to think of art as an investment for me. It doesn't work that way. If, if that were the case, I would probably invest money and have more money to buy more art or something. You know, maybe I'd be, I'd be smarter, better if I thought that way. But as I look at my life, especially, um, especially as I look at my life as a more finite reality, um, you know, in light of certain things going on, I have absolutely no regrets whatsoever. I can regret a piece of art I walked away from um, because, oh, by the way, the Renwick Gallery had dibs on it and I didn't get it. Or, oh, I didn't get that particular Janet Biggs because her artist proof went to the Whitney and if I wanted a Janet Biggs to give to the Mint Museum, I was going to have to give them a different piece. You know, that's how it was going to be. So, um, you know, what else, what else? I'm just, I'm not a hoarder. The things I have are assigned to my children. As you speak to me now, I'm simply a trustee. So everything is assigned to one of my children. I've got things that are earmarked now. There's something really special being picked up in um, September that's, you know, kind of a pivotal thing that's I think is very important. I think it's socially important. Um, that's a piece of art, but you know, I get to make those kinds of choices because there's no there's no upside for me that I make a wrong turn out of my driveway and I'm gone and it's like oh look at all this stuff I had warehoused. I almost I almost broke this. I just <laughs> I gestured. Nice catch. I was going to show off by saying cheers, and I almost broke my prop. Oh. <laughs> Nothing wrong with your reflexes. <laughs> I know I'm not gone yet, am I? I'm still here. Um, but, you know, absolutely, absolutely no regrets. I'm, I'm, I'm in it for, I'm in it for the energy of the making. I'm in it for, I'm in it for the absolute love of the creator. Thank you so much. You are I mean, the ideal dream collector for an artist. But, but, but it, it makes my life so much better. Why are people not talking about this? They don't know this in their lives. Do they, is it, is it possible that anyone, and I'm sure there have to be more people who feel, who feel as surrounded by all this wonderful creative energy as I do. Because I, sim I simply want to share it with more people. I want more people to live that way. And I don't feel limited. I can say to you right now, I, you know, simply, simply because of medication and, you know, things that are going on, I've, um, I'm not really supposed to be traveling right now. I've, kind of, I've got immune system issues. And I'm a person who is overwhelmingly grateful 
overwhelmingly grateful that I would get to take a trip and see this or that or the other sculpture that's practically at the end of the world that I really wanted to see. Is my life limited right now because I'm a little bit grounded and I'm at home? I mean, who knew that commercial flights and Zika are not um, good possibilities for a person, you know, but, but I'm not stuck. I'm not stuck because I am completely surrounded every space I walk into by thoughts and memories and anecdotes and the energy of people who are making and doing more things. I wasn't, I wasn't up on the mountain at the Penland auction this year. I don't know if I'm ever going to be any place outdoors in August the rest of my life, you know, where it's 100 degrees. But I definitely could be surrounded by all sorts of objects that I could walk around and I could say this, that, or the other came from this, that, or the other person in conjunction with that particular art auction. You know, and I could feel sort of a part and not feel that I've missed out on anything. You're an inspiration, Dana. Thank you. <laughs> Mimi, go ahead. Well, I, I thank you, Dana, for just being here to talk to us. I think you're, besides your euphoria that might have been caused by, for medical reasons or whatever, your no, passion no. is so inspiring. It's, 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 really, it's really not medical reasons. I'm actually... I'm actually less medicated than most, you know, contemporary well, moms. so much the better. But, <laughs> but your, your passion and your, and your willingness to be so open with us, I'm so grateful because that is the best inspiration for us as makers. Thank to, you. To know that somewhere at the end of that rainbow, there's somebody like you. But, if, but then I also love the idea that you are not the end. You're the conduit. Right. And I appreciate it. Very much. Right. right. It's to be to be a respectful, to be a respectful caretaker. You mm -hmm. know, when something when something um, there was there was a particular uh, piece just this past year. You know, when when something increases in value, or when something you realize it's fragile to it's fragile to the degree that it probably could be shared and put before more people. There are all kinds of reasons. Where are you, Mimi? I'm in uh, New Mexico and also California in Sausalito. Okay. Both okay. Places. Right now I'm in uh, Taos, New Mexico. You're in Taos. One, yes. one of my favorite places in, is in Taos. Really? Okay. Okay, one of my favorite places, yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I bought my little house within two hours. I was in Taos the first time. That's ah. how crazy I am. But I, I, really, I really appreciate the fact that you, you know, there, we all have different paths. And yeah. I'm, I just don't, I don't let things get in my way. I, I've always done things, found a way around hurdles and just go for it. Even though I know I may never get to the end, it's a process. I just keep going and I and keep you might, you might get you might get to the beginning before you get to the end. I think I don't I don't get concerned with those, but I would say I would say because I can't sit and have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or whatever with you tomorrow. I would say that in Taos mm -hmm. at the Harwood, yes, is the Agnes Martin Gallery. Yes. Uh-huh. And for all of you who don't know that experience or you have not been there, Mimi and I are going to have this moment that when you go into the Agnes Martin Gallery, there's some of the most elegant, even austere, quiet paintings that you will ever see in your entire life. Let's talk about women and women. <laughs> And the, the Agnes Martin space at the Harwood is a place where you could actually take a moment and go and sit on one of those little golden wooden benches that are there. Those are Donald Judd benches. And you, could, 
Exactly. Yes. You could have you could have um, the perfect you could have the perfect visual place mm -hmm. to think about any sort of idea in any direction in your life or any decision you are making. It is mm -hmm. an extraordinarily beautiful space. Cool. Yes. Well, I, I, I hope I'll see you there sometime. Well, I, you know, get in touch. If you, if you send me something like, I, I'm, I'm kind of over um, connected to, mm -hmm. to people that I don't always remember, but if you send me a message and you mention Paul and this sort of thing, then the next time I'm in Taos, the next, I would hope I'd be in Santa Fe. There are things I love about Santa Fe. Sight, Santa Fe, I think is mm -hmm. extraordinary. And um, galleries like what Charlotte Jackson is doing in Santa Fe, very sophisticated aesthetic. Not yes, very. That, it's a beautiful gallery. Very sophisticated aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, we've sort of run out of time, but let's take two more questions. Giacomo, go ahead. Um. Okay. Um. One word you use it, I really love it, it's contest. When you start the conversation, and I feel, I just wanna ask uh, what I means for you, contest. Context, context, C-O-N-T-E-X-T, -E context. Context is, for me, um, within all other, within all other parameters. So, it's not that we have to get that precise or that, you know, um, defined about everything. But when we have a conversation right now, it's simply within the context of our meeting. Sometimes when I've spoken, when Paul's invited me, I've said something and I listened to it later and I thought, oh, that sounded ridiculous. Oh, that sounded stupid. What was that? But it's within the context of the conversation and your work is within the context of you, your life, your heart, your perspective. This is what we can't discount, is that something within your specific perspective could touch that which is so universal and human that it would have the possibility of affecting a great number of humans. That's, that's the greatest hope for art. It doesn't always happen. You know, when I was, you know, sometimes you just, you get to go out and you get to paint a sign that day, or you're hired to do this piece, or you're doing that piece. But, but we're in it. We're in it, most of us, because we truly, with all of our hearts, have some sense that we could communicate that which is human, but transcends the finite words and language that we struggle with verbally across cultures and across socioeconomic barriers and racial barriers and sexual barriers. And that we could just say, this is what it is. This is a human expression that is beautiful. And that there would be that universality. That is the highest trajectory. And beyond that, and all the, there are all these other completely legitimate purposes and reasons to make it and do it too. But to do it from your perspective, that's what you have to own first because no one else can speak from your, your perspective, your point. That's your context. That's what has to be authentic. That's what has to be legitimate. That's what allows me to be a person speaking the way I am right now with such authority because... I'm me. I'm the authority on me, and that's what I'm doing, okay? So on that, I don't have anyone else buying for that position. That's the best way to be the artist. Thank you. Yeah, that's pretty awesome, Dana. Um, <clears throat> and also, everybody else pulled down their hands. Um, I think that's a, a great summation. Let, you know, you guys... Um, should listen to Dana's other webinars. And it's really clear to me, Dana, that you've grown a lot and your taste has changed. I'm going to go with grown. 
And, you know, we all do and we all continue to grow. And I think, you know, being involved in the arts, I think, adds years to whatever lives, you know, trajectories we have. And it keeps yes. our, it keeps our yeah. perspective younger and it keeps us, you know, it's such a better way to be alive. Best life. Totally. Dana, let me unmute everybody so we can all thank you and love you. And love you. Thank 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 you.